All right, math magicians. Today we're going to be solving and graphing inequalities. And the moment you see the word inequalities, and in English, in means not. And that looks like hot, but it's not. Not and equal means equal. So things that are not equal to each other. So maybe instantly in your head you might think less than, you might think greater than, you might think less than or equal to, you might link greater than or equal to. Officially, an inequality is this too, not equal to. But we're not actually going to cover that one very much. All right, so by way of warm up, we're writing a mathematical statement, which you've already done. So the age of the professor is A equals 32. So this is an equation. But the maximum capacity of the room is 235, which means it can go all the way up to 235. So if I say P for people, and it can go all the way up to 235, but it doesn't have to be 235. So it can be under or equal to 235. So that is essentially what this is here. We're just practicing what we're doing here. Uh, the student must earn at least 450 points. There are 17 deer in the woods. There we go. And then uh, at least 14 people are sick today. So it could be 14 or 15 or 16, etc. All right. Just so that we are equitable, our super secret rule for, of inequalities is this. So please take a moment to write this down with me. And we'll say it again here. Treat inequality is the same as equations. Add two to both sides, divide by six, all that stuff. Same thing. Except there's one caveat. When we multiply or divide by a negative, we have to flip the symbol. So if it's a less than, it's going to split this flip to a greater than, etc. When we uh, solve for an inequality, we usually get an expression similar to this. So I'm just going to write an example over here. We might get an, an answer that says this, x is greater than 12. The way we interpret that, it means this. My answer or my solutions are all the numbers, all real numbers, that are greater than 12. So you could say 12.1. You could say 12.0001. You could say 100. You could say 100.3, right? All of those work. But how to represent that graphically? We have a few things to recall. So the first thing here, number one, we have to bother about what type of point we're going to use. We're either going to use an open point or a closed point. And then shading, which direction are we going to shade? I've placed it such that my variable is on the left side, so my variable is greater. It works here. If you switch it, if you switch it, for example, if I said this, 12 is less than x. Those are equivalent statements. But I have to remember that since these are flipped, I have to pay attention to which direction I'm shading. So, all right, let's see here. If I have a greater than symbol, which is simply this, that's how we read this symbol, greater than. We're simply going to do an open point that just looks like that. An open point, a circle, essentially. And greater usually means we're going to shade to the right. So, make a prediction. What do you think? Tell your neighbor, what are we going to write in these two boxes there? Go. It's going to be open there. However, we do shift it and it changes to the, goes to the left. And left is less than, smaller. And that's on a number line, which we'll get to. All right. Now we can make a prediction here. But notice the key operative here. Whenever we have a, an equal to component, an equal to, we're going to have, so that means you fill it in, like so. So it's a closed point. 
filled in like that. And since we have greater than, we're going to go to the right. And since we have less than, we're going to go to the left here. Again, all of this is from the perspective of my variable on the left. Variable on the left. Things do change if your variable's on the right. Just the shading. We have to pay attention to the shading. So notice what we're going to do here. Three things. We're going to solve the equation, excuse me, inequality. We're going to graph it. We're also going to choose a number to check. Okay. So as we said before, we're going to treat this exactly as if we had an equal sign, except when multiplying or dividing by negative. So starting here, I am going to sub add 23 to both sides. And when I say both sides, I mean both sides of the inequality symbol. So if you need to see an imaginary line dashed here, just to give yourself a perspective, that might be helpful. Now I bring down the 3x. I bring down the symbol. The symbol's the same. It's still less than. And when I add these two together, I get 66. Uh, Next step, I need to isolate the x by dividing by 3. Notice I'm dividing by a positive. The 3 on the bottom in the denominator is positive. So no alarms need to go off. No switching of my symbol needs to happen. So all I do is straight divide now. X, symbol stays the same direction. And I'm left with 22. So here is part 1. I've solved it. Now I want to graph it. When you are graphing, look what not to do. Eyes up here just to see what not to do. Example B is very similar to the one we just did, example A. It is two-step, so we are going to start off by adding, excuse me, subtracting 11 from both sides. Remember, we're undoing the order of operations, so adding and subtract comes, come last in the order of operations. So when we're undoing things, I'm going to undo the adding and subtract first. All right, now I'm going to write exactly what I see here. I bring down the greater than symbol, and I bring down the negative 5 there. Notice on this one, not only do I have to undo the divide by 4, multiply by 4, but I need to get this negative taken care of too. We can do that in one step. All right, so here's what a lot of us will do. You'll probably just put the dot and say 4 over here are negative, or you'll put parentheses like this and do times negative 4. The moment you write, the moment you write the times negative 4, beep, 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 that's how you turn off the alarm, is that when you multiply or divide by a negative, you have to flip the symbol. And some of you say, oh, but Swenson, I'm going to switch this, flip the symbol on the next step, like so. And the answer is, yes, it needs to be flipped down there. But the moment you write the negative, that's the moment we have to deal with the flip of the, uh, the, flip of the symbol there. So the argument is that all the real numbers that are less than 20, so not including 20, but anything less than. And let's also see the instructions here. Remember, it says solve, graph, and check. So I've got two other things to do. So let me graph this. When we are graphing this, what we want to do is focus our attention on the 20. So I'm going to go a little bit above the 20 to a 21, go a little bit below the 20 to a 19. Because of this symbol right here is less than, it's only... Less than, it does not include. So I'm going to do an open point at 20. And the less than part, t is less than, so it's all the numbers that are under it. Your textbook is going to do this, where you're going to have it shaded right here. It's just shaded like this with an arrow going that way. The problem is I have the ability here to do highlighting and change of colors. But you probably don't as easy with your pencil. So I suggest doing it like this. Just have an open or closed point and then draw the arrow above instead of on the graph just so that it doesn't make it look sloppy. So this is how I prefer it. 
Last thing, we need to check. So I'm choosing one number underneath the 20 to put into there. Anybody have a suggestion as what nice number we can? Go ahead. 19. 19 works, but why don't I like 19 so much right here? Because I have to divide by 4. And 19 doesn't divide by 4 so easily. It does. It gives me a decimal. It's just not a whole number when I divide it. The easiest of all numbers to check, remember, if you choose to check over here, you'll get a true statement. If you choose to check over here, you'll get a false statement. Both are equally valid in checking. So you could have chosen 100 over here and expect a false and get a false. Over here, I'm going to choose a nice number. If you chose 16, that at least divides evenly here. Um, I'm going to choose zero because I prefer uh, things to drop out pretty easily. So in my check, I'm going to say t equals zero because zero is definitely less than 20. So the opposite of zero divided by four plus 11 should be greater than six. Zero plus 11, greater than six. 11 greater than six, that's a check. And one thing to note about the check, the check does not prove 100% that we are right, as opposed to an equation, which does. This just tells me that I'm probably right. All right, on our next page, let's look at example C. And we're getting things a little bit more complicated here. But again, treat these exactly the same as you would an equation, except when we multiply or divide by a negative. So I am going to, in this case, distribute the two into the parentheses there. So my next step is to bring down the h. Now multiply out to get 6h. Multiply out to get 8. And everything else is the same. All right, we are going to combine like terms here. However, you could also, at the exact same time, as you're combining like terms here to get 7h, if you wanted to also move the 8 to the other side, you could just to save some time. So I went ahead and did two steps at once right there to put a negative 7 on the right side. Like I said, that could have been broken up into two separate lines. And now I divide by 7 here. No alarms going off because the divide by 7 is positive. So h is greater than negative 1. So there's my solution. And thank you, keep my greater than or equal to. Now when I graph this, I'm going to focus on the negative 1, go up to 0, down to negative 2. I don't need to have 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, etc. I am going to have a closed point at the negative 1, and I'm going to go in the greater than direction, numbers that are greater. So I'm going to choose a number that is actually greater than negative 1. Zero is a nice one. So if I plug zero here, zero here, but I could choose 10, 15, 100. So for my check, I'm going to say h is zero. You're going to notice I check zero a lot because zero is one of the easiest numbers to manage. Uh, I'll run out of space over there, so I'm actually going to do the check underneath here. Check h equals zero. So when I plug things in, I get this 3 times 0 plus 4 greater than or equal to 1, like so. Notice all that drops out there. Even if I distribute this to here to get a 0 still, I distribute that to get an 8. So 8 is greater than or equal to 1. So it does clean up nicely. 0 definitely works. Again, you're allowed to check negative 1 but I prefer that you check something that's inside the uh, range of the uh, solutions. So we have this. One thing to note is that I have r's, my variables, on both sides. I am going to distribute on the left side. I'm going to distribute the positive 2 to get 8 minus 4r. My symbol stays the same. On the right side, I'm going to distribute the negative 2. So negative 2r minus 10. So I now see that I have variables on both sides, so I have to collect my variables. When you are collecting your variables 
and it doesn't actually matter which one goes to which. So it was suggested that we will do this here, like so. While we are here, let's save time and energy and cats. So I am going to move my constant to the other side as well by subtracting 8. The side away from the variable, moving that to the other side. So on the left side, I end up with negative 2r, less than is still. And then over here, I get negative 18. Again, the variables drop out here. The constant drops out here. Now we have to beep, 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 beep. There we go. Oh, so annoying. Good. Now we divide by negative 2. So r is now greater than double negative here. A negative divided by negative is positive, so we get 9. If I were to graph that, again, focus on the 9. Just put here a 10 there and a, an 8 there. Open point. And it does go to the right greater than like so. If you choose to check this with a number that is greater, you expect true. But if you check with 0, you expect false. I'll go ahead and check it with a number that's clearly greater. So uh, let me plug in r is equal to 10. And I'll plug things in. My expectation is true, of course. So 2 times 4 minus 2 times 10. Salud is less than negative 2 times 10 plus 5. I'm going to start simplifying. 2 stays on the outside there. This one is 4 minus 20, less than. And this one here is negative 2 times 15. 2 times negative 16, less than negative 30. Negative 32 is less than negative 30, and that is a check. I expected true, and I got true. So on occasion, of course, we could come up with uh, infinitely many, as the book says, but another uh, or better reading of that would be all real numbers. So as we walk through here, we'll go step by step. So the negative 3 distributes here to get negative 6x plus 15. Greater than is still the same, negative 6x plus 9. Now I'm going to add 6x to both sides in order to collect my variables, like so. But it turns out the 6x's go away. Folks, we do not need to write the 0x. We just bring down the 15. We bring down the less, the greater than, and we bring down the 9. The x's drop out. Now, we know that this is a true statement. We already knew that 15 was greater than 9. But because of that, that means there's never a value of here that would make that change. I can put in a, uh, a 6 here. I can put in a 32. I can put in a negative 5,000. Because the answer is always going to be true, I need to make a conclusion here. All real numbers. All real numbers. And if you wanted to abbreviate that using our symbol for real numbers, which is an R with an extra leg, you may do that. So as we look over here, there will be a situation where we get no real solutions or no solutions at all. Nothing works. So as I distribute that 2 inside, I get 4x minus 6. When I subtract 4x from los dos lados, we end up negative 5 is less than negative 6. Now, some of you can see that quickly, that this is a false statement. Um, but if you kept going for whatever reason, so I'll just take a second here to, to show what happens. If I add 5 to both sides, I now have 0 on this, less than negative 1. So it's another statement. But no matter which one we look at, the penultimate or the ultimate, they still are saying the same thing. That's a false statement. So. Again, we interpret it in our brains, we say false. In our brains, we say false. And our conclusion is no solutions or no solution. That is the thing we commit to, no solution. 
just like previously, I didn't circle the 15 is greater than 9. I circled and committed to all real numbers as my solution. So I do apologize. There are two uh, errors in this one. Uh, it should be an empty crate. So Ernest works in the shipping department loading crates with boxes. So we've got a large crate. That's my crate. And we're going to put little boxes in there like so. Okay, so each one of these things is a box. And the entire crate, the empty crate right there, weighs 150 pounds. How many boxes, each weighing 35 pounds, can Ernest fit, so my apologies, fit in the crate if the total weight is to be no more than 850 pounds? So 850 pounds is the max, probably has to do with the forklift raising it up or the strength of the crate itself. So the question is, how many to fit in there? Now, one way to do this is exactly what I just did. You could keep just drawing boxes and adding 35 every time. The problem with that is you might end up drawing and counting 20, 30, 40 boxes. And that gets tedious after a while. So let's use the magic of math to come up with a situation. As we are setting this up, we have to think what we're adding together. What we're adding together is poundage. We've got the weight of a crate, we've got the weight of all the boxes, and it's gotta be less than or equal to the maximum weight, the weight that we're allowed. Well, we know one of these already, very straightforward. We know that the weight of the crate is 150 pounds. That's given to us. So. If I just bring that down and say 150 belongs here, plus, what about the weight of the boxes? Hmm. We don't know how many boxes because, folks, that's the question. It's asking us how many boxes. So let's define that over here. Let's say B is the number of boxes that I'm going to have. Now, before we jump into it, and even before we finish the solution here to figure out stuff, what is a reasonable number to expect? Okay, so Jules says definitely less than 850. But can it be, is there a reasonable number that's even less than that? Uh, one more, guess, go ahead. All right, so maybe 20. What number does not make sense when I start taking some guesses. Good, we cannot have negative numbers. So the answers could be one, it could be two, it could be three, et cetera, it could be 20. It might be, uh, you know, it might be even higher, but I doubt it's gonna get even into the hundreds. I doubt it's gonna get to the hundreds because 100 boxes is 3,500 pounds, obviously way too big. So. Notice that we could actually get a range of numbers. Now, this isn't the answer. What we're doing is just pr priming the pump, making sure that we have an understanding of what kinds of numbers to get. All right, so come back up here. We expect, we know that each box is 35 pounds times the number of boxes we load in. That has to be less than or equal to the total weight of 850 pounds. Once we have this equation set up, now we can subtract 150 from both sides. And we end up with 35B. Notice that your handwriting here is important. If your B looks like a six, suddenly you've changed the in entire situation. So here I get 700. So by the way, the question that this asks is without the crates, how many boxes, the boxes must be under 700 pounds, all the boxes. So when you solve this, that's what you get. So divide both sides by 35. Now, this will give us a whole number, but it doesn't have to be. So the number of boxes is less than or equal to 20. All right, so let's bring that back over here. Um, at most, 20 boxes per crate. And there we go. Now let's look at this next problem here. 
Example G, Julie is three miles ahead of Ming while biking on a rail trail. If Ming speeds up to 16 miles per hour, for how long will he be behind her? Let T be time in hours. <clears throat> now, here's the one problem, is that we do not know how fast Julie is going. So that's a misprint, I forgot to put in that. So let's go ahead and put in that she is currently traveling 11 miles per hour. Okay, so how do we set this one up? Well, graphically speaking, what we have is this. We have someone starting here, someone here, and this person's traveling at 11 miles an hour. This one's traveling a little bit farther, so, or faster, excuse me. So as this one moves, this one will go smaller rate, then this will catch up, then this will go here, then this will go here, then they go here, and eventually they'll be in the same place. So the question is, how long will that be? So, we know that Julie will be ahead for a while. So let's remember that uh, rate equals distance over time, or another thing to consider it is distance is rate times time. So let's set this up. Ming's distance traveled is going to be 16 miles per hour times however long he's going. That is gonna be underneath or behind of Julie's, which is 11 miles per hour times time, but notice she has an advantage. What advantage is that? She's got a gap already there of three miles. So she's ahead of him. So he's gonna be trying to make up that distance with the difference between their speeds there. So if you subtract 11 T from both sides, you get five T over here. So 5t is less than or equal to 3. In other words, the distance that they're, excuse me, the, the difference in speed, 5 miles per hour, uh, needs to make it, how long will it take for the 5 miles to miles per hour to make up 3 miles? All right, so let's go on. All we have to do is divide. Divide both sides by 5. Now this gives me a decimal, or a fraction, 3 fifths. Or another way of saying that is 0 0.6. But what is that of? Well, it's hours, right? So if I were to take the 0 0.6 and multiply it by 60 minutes per hour, what do we get? 36 minutes. So a little bit more than half an hour. He'll be behind her. Uh, now, so T does mean hours. So if you did say 6 tenths of an hour, again, that doesn't really help us out. So, uh, so currently it starts out with hours, but then we're gonna convert it back to real world. So there you go. Ming will be behind for 36 minutes.